Hey guys, our martial arts in Japan playlist of videos attracts questions from people who are interested in doing martial arts in Japan. Fairly regularly we get questions about that. So, fairly difficult question to answer because it depends on the person, depends on the martial art, depends on the school. There's a lot of variables, so it's pretty hard to give a general answer to this one, but we'll have a go. Uh, first of all, there is some modern style martial arts schools in Japan, for example, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and uh, mixed martial arts gyms and things like that. So there's, there's some sort of modern martial arts schools in Japan. Probably more, it's probably easier to get into them Generally, now all this is generalization because it depends on the school and the person and everything else. But, for example, a, a, a Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school in a big city, it's a good chance that they might already have a foreigner in their school or have had foreigners in their school or something. So, you might just be able to walk in and say, Hi, I'd like to join your school, please, and, and join up. It's possible. It depends, it really depends on the school, but it's more likely that, that would, you'd have a chance there. And again, generally, generally in the big cities, uh, you might have a better chance of joining, joining a school in a big city, generally. Uh, having said that, there is also a lot of traditional schools, obviously, more, more, more of the schools are traditional schools than they are modernized. So uh, for the traditional schools, it's going to be more difficult. There's a few routes you can take. Uh, one is, it's possible for some people to get a uh, cultural visa to visit Japan to study some form of Japanese culture. So people, people often get those for pottery or for calligraphy or uh, some sort of traditional Japanese art. And it's possible to get them for martial arts as well. Uh, but you have to fulfill a certain number of requirements, uh, some of which are extensive experience in your own country, and it has to be extensive. So, you know, saying that you've done three years and you're a second queue in karate or something probably isn't going to get you here um, because it's not really extensive enough. It's that sort of a beginner's hobby sort of thing, as far as they're concerned, you know. So you'd really need to be like Nidan, Sundan in something in order to be able to convince them that, that you've got extensive experience. And then the next step is, police car, the next step is that you need a school that's prepared to take you on um, and to sponsor you. So it makes it really complicated. Uh, so that's one, that's one route. Uh, another route is just to be here on another visa uh, like a working visa or something for a year or two years or three years and and want to do some martial arts in your spare time while you're here. So whichever route you take there, um, if you're here for only three months, if you're just here for a holiday, you know, for three months or less, uh, like that, that is one of the more common questions we get. You know, when I'm in Japan, I'd really like to, to do some martial arts while I'm in Japan, you know, that's understandable, it is understandable, particularly if you're doing something traditional, you know, karate or judo or aikido or kudo or something that originates in Japan, it's understandable that you want to do some while you're here. But the way the way a lot of the schools would see it, a lot of the teachers would see it, would be they'd see it as a waste of their time because not all of them, of course. Some of them would go, hey, come on, come and join us and have some fun. And, and I, I've, I've been to schools like that where they're likely to do that, where some foreigner walks in the door and they say, oh, come over here and do this and try this. And, you know, some of them are like that. But, but it depends on the school and it depends on the, the martial art because a lot of the time in this modern world, they need to have insurance for the students and they need, and it's just a big hassle. It is just a big hassle to, for some of the schools to take on a, a new student. And just, if you know, you say, oh, I want to do some of this martial art and I'm only here for three months. You know, a lot of the teachers are going to see it as a waste of time. And a lot of them are probably just going to say, no, sorry, we can't, I'll, I'll do this. Mm, it's difficult, I'll say, mm, it's difficult. And, and they just won't want to do it because it'll just, they see it as a waste of time. What's the point? What's the point of, you know, a couple of months of teaching you stuff and then you, 
go away and, and probably don't come back and they just see it as a waste of time. So not real likely, but there'd be some that would. There'd be some that would, yeah, come and give it a try, you know. Um, some that would. The the other thing is if you're coming here long term, one of the other other routes is if you're doing a an art at a school that is connected to Japan. So if you're doing a type of karate where your teacher or your school has a connection with schools in Japan uh, or part of a group with schools in Japan, uh, then the traditional way of doing it is that the teacher organizes it for you. The teacher gets in contact with the branches in Japan and tells them when you're gonna be there and asks if they'd be kind enough to teach you. And then usually when you turn up to do something like that, usually you should bring a letter of introduction from your teacher, preferably written in really nice Japanese on a really nice piece of paper that really sort of formally introduces you and says that, you know, here is this person who is, you know, from this school and who has had this experience and has this ranking and usually. Um, some of the big uh, groups, some of the big international, so for example, there's some of the Aikido schools are international, some of the karate schools are international, and they have like a passport, which is a little book, and it has your gradings marked in there and everything, your whole experience, and you usually bring that and a letter of introduction from your teacher is a traditional way to do it. And then if you go that route, then theoretically, the teacher has organized it with the Japanese teachers before you even come here. Uh, and then you just walk in and you're all humble and polite. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that's already organized before you come here. That's, that's probably one of the easiest routes. Um, and it's the same as with that, uh, with the, with the cultural visa. Really, you need some sort of connection here. You know, you'd never get that visa and you'd never get accepted to do that unless you had some sort of connection either through other people or through your school or, you know, other students or, you know, it's possible to come here and just walk in, but, and we'll get to this in a minute, but it's to come in and walk in and say, hey, I want to get a culture visa and would you, would you, would you sponsor me for a culture visa or at the least they have to give you a letter saying that they're prepared or give a letter to the immigration department saying they're prepared to take you on and teach you and it has to be sort of full time there's a minimum number of hours a month it might have been 20 hours a month or something uh, more I can't remember but there's a minimum number of hours a month that you have to do of the practice in order for it to qualify for the cultural visa thing and you know that's a big ask getting someone to do that for you is really going to be tricky um, so yeah the reference, the reference from your from your own school in your own country, and then they have a connection with some kind of school in Japan, and they introduce you to the teacher in Japan and tee up the organised for, for you to meet them here, and then over you come and come and do the thing. Um, the other way, if you're just here anyway, and you're here for a year or here for a couple of years, and you're, you're, you're you've got a working visa and you're working or you're doing something else here, and then in your spare time you want to go and do some martial arts then probably the thing to do is to go to most most reasonable sized cities have some sort of dojo like a city dojo like a gymnasium and you would have already seen them on our on our martial arts playlist that we've shown you a few of those already and even not very big towns have have pretty good dojo you know so you go to one of those and usually they have some sort of notice board or something that has all the different lessons, all the different schools and what they do. Um, so you'd need a pretty good level of Japanese to sort all that or take someone with you who can translate it for you and find out, you know, have a bit of a look, see what schools are there, what, what days they practice and then uh, turn up on one of their practice days. Now, etiquette, mm, the etiquette that's taught in dojo in outside Japan, the etiquette that's taught in other countries, is not necessarily the same etiquette that you'll experience in Japan. So even if your teacher's, you know, trained for a couple of years in Japan, or, you know, he's got big connections with Japan, he knows all about it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the etiquette that you practice in your dojo is the same that they practice in Japan. It's quite often different. It's quite often very different. So uh, then what you need to do, you found out, okay, Thursday night, seven o'clock, they, they practice in this dojo, okay. Um, if, if you've got a very good level of Japanese, polite, 
Japanese, uh, you could probably do it yourself. If not, you'd be wise to find someone who is polite and presents well, because um, that's really important here, you know. You don't want to turn up with some wild, ratty looking dude, you know. You're better off turning up with someone that sort of presents well and is sort of, you know, good at the etiquette thing, Japanese person, and, and ask permission so whether it's yourself or whether it's this person doing it with you, if you're doing it on your own, either way, walk in, get to the door, ask permission to come in, ask permission to sit. Is it okay if I just sit and watch some class, please? Um, is the best way to do it, and then just sit there and watch and don't say anything. And quite often they'll just point to a piece of floor. <laughs> but mate, if you're lucky, it's tatami. If you're not lucky, it's wood. Sit on the floor over there and uh, go and sit in the Seizo in that corner over there and watch, you know. So, not necessarily, you can sit there with your legs crossed, or they might offer you, it depends, it depends on the dojo, it depends on the dojo, sometimes there'll be a chair, if you're lucky, and you just sit there and watch. And the best way to do it is not to be turning up saying, hey, I want to practice some martial art. It's, it's not necessarily the best way to do it. The way that the teachers would feel is if you're putting them on the spot to do that. You, what you're better off doing is going and watching a class and if you, you like what they're doing and you think you'd like to do it too go on, ask if you can when you finish say thank you very much and and do you mind if i come back and watch another class and this is the best strategy and go back two or three times or four times and watch a few classes and be patient because in japan as you've seen also what you want to do watch all the videos on our how-to playlist because a lot of the stuff on there is relevant quite often Traditional dojo are like a center of Japanese culture, quite often. Particularly if you do something like uh, kudo or something like that. The, the people, that, the sort of people that do kudo or sort of people that do traditional arts are quite often heavily into the other parts of the culture as well. So quite often those environments, particularly something like kudo, are a real center of Japanese culture and manners and politeness and what's appropriate and what's not. So you gotta really watch yourself in dojo, you really do. And again, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Dojo in Tokyo, you know, that's different, that's different. But I'm talking about traditional Japanese school, you know, in a traditional Japanese Dojo. And particularly if you're somewhere outside the cities where you might be the first foreigner that's ever walked in there, you want to tread really lightly. Because they could be, if you walk in there and, and carry on or behave in a way that might be appropriate in our own country but might not be appropriate in Japan, they will be smiling at you and really nice to you and you'll have no chance of practicing in that dojo because they'll make a decision about you when they're watching you and if they decide no nah, this guy's because we're scary foreigners are scary to a lot of people because of our behavior what we might do because when you when you join a group like a, a dojo like that or like join a school you are then a part of that school and you represent them so if you you know, you're in some big dodge that's shared by other schools, and you but you make some, you know, error, so I do something that embarrasses the school. It's going to be really embarrassing for them. So they're taking a real risk by accepting us into their schools. You know, so they've got to be convinced first that you know that it's going to be okay that you're not going to do something to embarrass their school or cause them any sort of problems, make any waves. You know, so. You know, the best thing is sit there and watch a few lessons, be really quiet, be really modest, and it's likely that they'll ask you, have you got any martial arts experience? And the best answer to that, if you have, if you have, if you've done a fair bit, the best answer to that is, oh, a little bit, but I'm only a beginner, right? And you better be speaking Japanese because unless someone come comes up to you and starts speaking English to you, in which case you'll obviously be able to speak English, but unless somebody does and there's a good chance that they won't you'd better be speaking Japanese <laughs> so you can see you can see it's not easy it's not easy if you really want to get in the door with a lot of schools it's not easy you know um, with again Tokyo Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, is a lot easier but but you know a lot of the traditional schools and traditional areas it's not easy so you have to be really modest and if they say to you have you done any martial arts if you are anything below about second dan in anything you're best off saying you're a beginner and even if you are a second dan you're better off saying oh only a little bit only a little bit have you done any martial arts oh just a little bit just a little bit i'm only a beginner i'm only a beginner don't even mention 
You know, don't even mention, we see it on our videos all the time, people saying, oh, I've got a black belt and this and a black belt and that. Well, as we've talked about before, um, you know, there's there's 15 year old kids here with black belts. Um, and, and Shodan, which is black, the first degree black belt, Shodan is first step. So Shodan is seen as a beginner here, as the first step, so, you know, modest as possible. And again, watch all those how-to videos. And we talk about compliments and modesty and we talk about all this stuff. Watch all of them because in the dojo, that's where we've got to practice this stuff the most. And, you know, have you done any martial arts? Oh, hardly anything at all. No, no, I'm only a beginner. I'm only a beginner and I have no skill. And be super modest and really play it down. Um, and be aware that the other people will be doing the same. That some dude that's just having a chat to you there could end up, you know, you, you're watching and you can see that there's the teacher out the front talking and then some other guy comes along and starts talking to you and you don't know who he is. Now he could be fourth, fifth Dan, sixth Dan himself, quite possibly. You know, one of the dojo I go to, half, half the people who practice there are over fourth Dan. And, you know, everybody else is, is your dance. Everybody else is, has a Dan rank of some description. You know, there's occasionally a couple of beginners come along there, but pretty much the whole class is all your dancha. So, you've got to be really aware of this, really respectful to everybody, really polite, really modest, because there's a good chance too, um, they often have little meetings about this. So quite often what will happen is, you keep going to those classes and watching those classes, eventually they might invite you, hey, would you like to try some? Would you like to join us? Would you like to try some? And they might let you just try some. Um, and you just have to be really gentle and don't be, hey, I want to do this, I want to join your school. It's better off not to, just be really gentle. And if it gets to the point where they're talking about you joining their school, uh, or they invite you to, which is, if you keep going and behaving the right way, that's, that's possible. Um, it's quite possible that what they'll do is they'll talk about it between themselves first and quite often that's what happens is that the teachers, the senior people uh, will sit around a table and I, I was actually in on one of these discussions once. A foreigner walked into a dojo that I was practicing on, practicing in and walked in and didn't behave real well and then later there was this table, it was sort of an impromptu discussion around a table where these senior people were sitting there drinking green tea and just talking about whether they should let him in or not. And more than half of them were sitting there tilting their heads and shaking their heads and, and, and didn't necessarily want him on board. And he didn't get an invitation. So, um, that's, I'm sure that's quite common. So, so as you can see, you know, again, Tokyo Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or mixed martial arts or something, you know, pay your money, join the school, join the group, probably. Um, but yeah, these traditional ones, you really have to mind your P's and Q's. And if you, if you Japanese isn't, you know, the, these things are all taught in Japanese as well, which is another reason that taking on foreigners is a hassle. Because unless your Japanese is really good, it's going to be frustrating for them. Um, trying to teach you everything if, if your Japanese isn't good. So your Japanese needs to be really, pretty good, really. Uh, otherwise, it's just too much of an ask, you know? Again, depending on what it is. So this has all been broad generalizations and it's gonna depend on where and which school and where it is and who's the teacher and who the other students are. And you know, if you're really lucky, there might be another student there who's, uh, whose English is okay, is prepared to help take you on or something. It just depends. But you know, if you do the things that we've mentioned in this video, it'll give you a chance of getting in the door anyway. And then you just have to mind your mind your behaviour and, and do the right thing. And just a couple of things. The reason I made this video was actually the first plan was to tell you on the way to the Dodger now and it's 35 degrees outside in the shade, it's 35 degrees. And the Dodger we're going to, the windows are really small and it's hotter inside than it is outside. So it's probably gonna be about 38 degrees, which is, for those of you who use the Qubit system, 38 degrees is about body temperature or a little bit higher. So pretty hot, pretty hot. And then put the big gi on, uh, it's pretty hot. And there is actually an air conditioner in there, but they don't turn it on. Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not good for the environment. So they, they avoid using the air conditioner. Um, so that's summer. And then in winter, I've actually done, been in a Qdor dodge, I was doing Qdor when snow was blowing in because the Qdor's the archery, Japanese archery, a traditional 
Japanese archery and, and standing at the shooting line firing and of course it's big open there's no wall there and there was snow blowing in through this big open space blowing in on us and we're standing there in fairly light gi with Hakama and uh, tubby so it's like thin socks on a wooden floor and it was like minus 10 and uh, and these dojo are the same these these uh, these uh, Aikido dojo are the same they have the windows are open in, in winter as well and they usually only close them if the snow is actually coming in the window so in, in winter you know you walk in there and no shoe no socks at all of course in a, do, in a Aikido on an Aikido dojo so walk in there and you've got your, your gi on but bare feet and it's you know, minus 10 degrees and uh, freezing you know and your gi is cold when you put it on you're freezing to death and people comment they will comment they don't complain so they go geez it's hot isn't it or you know it's cold isn't it so i walk in there in a minute and they're all going to say it's hot isn't it and it's not a complaint so you just got to be really careful if you do end up in one of these dodgy you have to be really careful you don't complain you just go along with everything and you agree but you don't complain so for example it's really tempting not tempting to say why is there a brand new air conditioning system here and we don't turn it on you know it's just the way it is. An old guy said to me once, an old teacher said to me once, uh, you can't choose you can't choose the weather when you go into battle. And it's the way a lot of the old schools see it is uh, is that Budo is a practice of the martial arts and so we're practicing for war. I mean it's not really really the way they we practice now, but his his what he was saying was that that you know it's Budo, it's Budo and whatever the weather you know, if you're going into battle, you have to do it in whatever weather. Good point, you know. So we have to fight a battle tomorrow against some other group. Um, you know, whether it's snowing or raining or hot or cold or whatever it is, we have to go with it, don't we, you know. So um, that's the way a lot of the old guys see it. They just take it, you know. So if you're doing a part of a school, you have to be really careful. Mind your P's and Q's, go with everything, be super modest. Watch that how-to playlist. Watch the how-to playlist, it's really important. It's really important, you know. A lot of dojo in, in other countries, there's a lot of strutting around and a lot of ego going on. Uh, that's not so common here. Uh, some karate dojo can get a bit, little bit like that, a little bit, but generally not. Generally, everyone's, everybody's modest. And be really careful who you're talking to, because they'll go, oh, they'll tell you they have, they don't know much about it, and they don't have much experience. And you'll find out later that person's fifth dan, they've been doing it for 40 years. So, <laughs> anyway, so those people that are asking about doing martial arts in Japan, hopefully that gives you a few answers there anyway. Hope it helped. More videos coming soon.